Dadhood. Modern Dadhood Podcast. <laughs> Let's have a podcast. Okay. Do it. Hey, Mark. Adam Flaherty. Hey. It's Adam Flaherty. <laughs> You've been writing a lot of a lot of jingles lately. I'm just a jingle machine, man. Give me anything, I'll turn it into a jingle. Go ahead, try me. Try me. Chris Gethard. Ooh, Chris Gethard. Have you heard? He's on the podcast today. There you go. <clears throat> oh, just settling in. This is modern dadhood. An ongoing conversation about the joys, challenges, and general insanity of being a dad in this moment. My name is Adam Flaherty. I'm a father to two girls. One is eight and the other is five. And my name is Mark Checkett. And I am a dad to twin boy four-year-olds. Bam. Boom coming goes in, the dynamite. Coming in hot with the four. We want to take a second to welcome any new listeners to Modern Dadhood. We're really glad that you're here with us. We would love for you to be part of this conversation by following Modern Dadhood on Instagram or Facebook, uh, subscribing wherever you listen, and leaving us a rating or a review. We would love to hear from you. You can email Mark and myself anytime at hey, H-E-Y, at moderndadhood.com. And if you are new, then you then you probably don't know us very well. And um, I'll, I'll t- Adam Adam is the whip, smart, political, savvy. You know, he'll come at you hard with the hard hitting questions. And me, I'm just the wise, cracking sidekick. Okay, you're a hoot, man. You're the soft talking, mm-hmm. wise cracking son of a bitch. They call me slow hands. Check it. <laughs> so now you know us. Now you know us. Here's something I'd like to remind (laughs) old listeners and for any of the new listeners out there, this will be the first time you hear this. Me and Adam, we are not experts, even though it kind of sounds like we are. Uh, We're not. Not at all. Are you an expert? Just a couple of. Di- yeah. Are you, are you an expert? <laughs> sorry, you're just, you were just you were going to go just a couple of dinks, weren't you? And I cut you off. Just a, No, I was going to say I was going to say just a couple of dads oh. figuring it out as we go. I thought you were going to I think you're going to call but us we dinks. Are dinks. Yeah, no, you, we're definitely dinks. Well, I know I was going to was I was going to say I was going to give you a minute to clarify. Are you an expert in any other way? No. Oh, yeah, me neither. I'm novice across the board. Yeah, yeah me neither. Maybe someday. Maybe, someday. One, maybe one of us yeah. will become an expert in something someday. So as we teased at the very beginning of the episode, uh, today's guest is comedian Chris Gethard. And Mark, you and I had such an awesome conversation with Chris and such an important conversation recently about mental health and about fatherhood that um, I want to get right into that conversation. But before we do, I think it's worth mentioning that just a few days ago, uh, something really very sad happened that has a connection to the show. Yeah, that's right. We collectively, we lost a great one. Uh, the the great Emilio Delgado has has passed away. Emilio played Luis on Sesame Street. Mm-hmm. And uh, I just want to you're, you're welcome to go back and listen to that episode. Uh, perhaps we'll throw a link in the show notes if you're curious to hear the conversation. But he uh, was just a really delightful person. Uh, always had a big smile. Yeah. One, yeah, he I mean, he was such a somehow <laughs> somehow he was really relatable and down to earth, even though he through his work, particularly on Sesame street changed and touched so many people's lives. He was on Sesame street from 1971, I believe to 2016. That is a long run. Anyway, he had a long and storied career there uh, and did a bunch of other things besides that. And if you don't go listen to our episode, then at least go back and watch some old episodes of Sesame street. Cause he was a real gift. We're wishing the best to Emilio's family, his wife, Carol, and just feel really grateful to have had the opportunity to to spend an hour with him talking about his career and about fatherhood. Chris. 
Chris Gethard is a comedian, actor, and author. You can find his podcasts anywhere you listen to Modern Dadhood, his amazing stand-up material on Netflix, HBO, and all over the internet. And he's joining us on this podcast today to talk about dad stuff, including his powerful new essay just released on script called Dad on Pills. Hello. What's up, Chris? How's it going? What an honor to have you here, man. Could, are, are we allowed to call you Geth? Yeah, feel free. That's what many, many people in my life call me that. So have at it. So loaded, bit of a loaded question, but how are you? I mean, we know that there is a, uh, you're, you're sort of in this supposed to be on tour, but can't because of a little thing called COVID right now. So yeah, it, well, you know, actually I'm feeling very hopeful this week because we're recording this just a couple of days after they... Uh, just after Pfizer asked for authorization for my son's age group to get vaccinated. So mm-hmm. that finally, fe- that that's the corner I've been waiting to turn before it can feel like my life gets back to relatively normal. I mean, there's been a lot of progress with that. And I think like everybody, there's like between the COVID fatigue and learning how to navigate it, everybody started sort of getting back to their lives and when, you know, Winter's really bad, but spring was good last year. But then the the vaccine news was like, oh, at that point, my son will be as safe as I am so I can maybe get back on the road. And, you know, it, it was so tough pushing my tour. We, we canceled four months worth of touring, uh, which is like, there's a guy with a two-year-old and a mortgage, a very scary thing to do in in one day, but realized my wife was so cool about it, but every time I was about to go out on the road, you know, it'd be Tuesday, Wednesday, and I'm supposed to leave Thursday or Friday. And we'd just sit down and go, okay, let's look at the numbers. Does it feel Mm -hmm. safe? What's the venue's policies and this and that. And I just went, I, I can't have this stressful conversation 20 times in the next three months. So let's just push it all. Just push it all, and it was hard, and it was stressful. But I'm I'm so happy that there's about to be a vaccine for kids in my age group, and I know every parent has to research it and do their own soul searching. But I feel like my wife and I will we will have our little guy at the front of the line. I'm so ready to move on and and feel that sense of security. Absolutely. Yeah. And your son, it's it's Cal. Yeah, his name's Caleb, but everybody just calls him Cal, which is a real good fit. And at, at two and a half, he was he must have been born sort of right before. The shit hit the fan. Oh, well, we lived in Queens. <laughs> if you want to hear a really intense thing. So the New York Times did an expose on Elmhurst Hospital in Queens, New York. If you walked out our front door and made a right and walked three blocks, you were at the front door of that hospital. So all that wow. stuff in those early days, all the footage of the refrigerator oh, trucks, man. And the nurses who were sneaking video to show how insane it was in there. That was next to our house. And we had a whole thing happen where we had already bought a house in Jersey. We were going to move out to the suburbs. And then our building banned movers from coming in. And I was like, I totally get it. But also, like, we have a kid who's about to turn one and another house that will be safer. You can't tell us where we're allowed to raise them. Right. That was very tense. And we wound up just kind of like fleeing and my parents are snowbirds, so they were in Florida, and, and their house in uh, the mountains in New York was empty. So we just like loaded up a car with as much stuff as we could fit. And it was so sad, man. He he was not even a year old, and we just picked him up out of a crib and threw him in a car, and we knew we were never going to go back to that house. I'm just like, man, this is the only house he's ever known. Now he'll never remember that. In in right. retrospect, it's far more traumatic for my wife and I than him. But right. that was a sad dad moment right there to just be like, <laughs> we are fleeing the only home you've ever known. And I'll also never forget too. It was uh, I had got my wife a Valentine's Day balloon, and my son loved it. He loved playing with it. And I remember we because we were trying to pack everything we might need for an indefinite amount of time in one car with all three of us but my son loved the balloon and Hallie's going, just ditch the balloon. I'm going, no, he loves the balloon. We're, I can't, I got to find a way to fit the balloon. So I managed to squeeze this balloon in on top of everything else and not pop it. And we got it to the house. And I was so proud of that, of like, this is so miserable, but my kid's still going to have his balloon. And then <laughs> yeah. I think you two as fellow dads will not be shocked to hear 
He never touched the balloon again. <laughs> right. Never. And three One weeks time. later, it was like at, at this weird density yeah. where it was floating through the middle yes. of the room, coming up behind you. Just oh, sad, yeah. yeah, sadly <laughs> dangling, not quite dead, but not really alive anymore. Sort of like all of us in March 2020. What, what a perfect um, metaphor. Yeah, it, truly, truly poetic. I guess the short version of that story is once again, my wife was correct about something. We should have just ditched <laughs> the balloon. Like like usual, she was typically right. how these things work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's two and a half now. How, what? Mm-hmm. How is it going? What are you, What are you guys into together right now? We, uh, I mean, it's trucks, it's dinosaurs. Um, those are the two really huge ones. He's getting really into music, which is cool to see. Oh, nice. He now like when we sing him songs for bedtime and nighttime, he he can sing along. He memorizes them and he'll oh, sing them back to us. Great. Very cool. So he's something of a genius. Create, creative genius. He's really good about peeing in the potty, but he's so embarrassed about the concept of poop that he just won't do it. Today was actually today was the first day that we tried underwear. He asked if he could have underwear for the first time. We had switched from diapers. We did cloth diapers. Then we switched to pull-ups. And he asked my wife this morning, can I wear underwear? And we thought that meant he was really ready and he has been peeing like a champ, and then he just decided to just poop in the just underwear. Just unload in the underwear. Yeah, and I, I, was ex- I was the one who discovered it, and I said, you really can't do this. And he said, no, I can. And I was like, it yeah, doesn't feel not? good, though, right, to poop in the underwear? And he went, it feels good. It feels fine. So he doesn't understand the concept. He just think, I think he just thinks that these are like boutique high-end diapers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. it's really, it's, we're right there, but then... He's a boy, and I understand that boys sometimes go this road. Like, there's he's terrible twos in a big way. So he's there's a lot of screaming, and when it's hey you pooped your diaper, we got to change you now. He's into hitting and kicking and throwing oh, stuff man. at us, and he's a very very sweet kid. But things flare up in that direction now too. So we're kind of in. It's a little bit. It's like the most pleasant, joyous, fun thing. He makes me laugh every day. But the potty training drama is like a war zone. It's not good. Sounds so familiar. Uh, How old are your guys' kids? So I I have twins. uh, They're both boys, and they are turning four in nine days. Oh wow! But I know I know that struggle. It's not too far in our in our past. And I've got uh, I've got two daughters, Chris, who are uh, eight and five. And man, I mean, everything is a phase. But we went through all that same stuff too, and it's just a new kind of crazy right now. And did you? I, cause I have friends who are raising girls who tell me the pot, I have not one, but two friends who say that their girls just decided one day they didn't want diapers anymore and just were potty trained overnight. Just fundamentally understood what was being asked of them. And were like, I don't want diapers anymore. I'm just going to use the potty. And it was just, they moved on with their lives. You know, I think you can, in some cases, make sort of generalizations about boys versus girls, but like ultimately it sort of just comes down to like the unique personalities and, you know, both my girls had a different sort of potty training journey, but, um, but they both ended up getting potty trained. So, you know, as long as you're, you're working towards that goal and, uh, and at the end of it, they're, uh, peeing and pooping on the potty and able to like, you know, keep themselves, uh, Mm -hmm. clean, I guess that's all you can hope for. Yeah, we're so close. I feel like we're like within weeks of me not having to have feces on my body. <laughs> yeah. I had that a few weeks ago. You guys would like that. I looked down and saw there was poop on my thumbnail. And then I started doing the math of like, when was the last time I changed them? And it was hours uh-huh. prior. And I was like, I've been to a store. I've taken yeah. work calls. Uh-huh. Right. Did and you I like start my to hands. inspect? Yeah, you're yeah exactly. I started looking around like, where else is it? Because I'm usually so good about getting it. I'm like, I've just had feces on me for hours and I had no idea. <laughs> this is yeah. so sad. So gross. I feel like we could probably talk about feces for the entire oh, yeah. session, but but it's really important to me that we do get into the the essay that you've just put out. You've done a lot of writing performing, talking about your history with mental illness and uh, parents listening. If you haven't seen it, you should absolutely go on HBO and watch Chris Gethard career suicide as soon as possible. But I'm wondering uh, if you can tell us sort of how you arrived first at the idea of publishing an essay. Well, I, you know, I, I tend to write a lot. It's part of the gig. And I, I found that just in the course of stuff I was writing for myself, a lot of it was focusing on on parenting, thoughts about my father. I had sort of touched upon some of the stuff and stuff I was just kind of putting out there on my website. And 
Scribd reached out and asked if I had any ideas. They were like, you're just someone we'd love to work with. And I was very flattered mm. by that. And I'll tell you, I'm, I'm really careful with the mental health stuff because I did my HBO special in 2017 and I'd worked on that show a few years beforehand. And I don't really, I have not tried to like commodify it or be the depression. I don't really, I'm not interested in making money off depression. And I always told myself like, you know, there's people come, Hey, can you come speak at this thing and we'll pay you and it'll focus on depression? I'll say it's a good hearted thing. And, but I don't want to just cash in on the fact that I've had that. So when Scribd came along, I said, you know, I just happened to be at a phase in my life where a lot of this stuff is coming out because one of the really shocking things when you become a parent, right, is you realize, oh, there's no guidebook. My parents did not know what they were doing. No parent does. I don't know what I'm doing. And I had just a lot of fear and a lot of real anxiety about should I be a parent when I, there's so much dark shit that I could pass on to him. And some of this is genetic and that feels like responsibility. And it was on my mind and I had been writing so much about it anyway. And I'm sort of like, well, this feels like a part of the conversation that needs to be had. And it feels like a healthy time to put it out there. And I was sort of looking around as a, a parent to be going, where's the dialogue on this? I couldn't find too much. And it's made me realize, you know, I think we've come a long way in the past five to 10 years about people talking about mental health, especially guys being vulnerable about it. One of the things I say in the essay is, you know, we are now amongst the first generations that have treated this with openness. Like we're the first generations that will just casually talk about what antidepressants you're on. It's not rare now to be in a bar and have somebody just tell you what their antidepressant cocktail is. That was unheard of even for most of my lifetime. So this also means we're the first generation of parents that are going to raise our kids under this new context. So I, I can't pretend that I have all the answers, but the essay brings up a lot of questions and it has a lot of funny stuff in it too. But at its core, it's just sort of like, I've dealt with a lot of mental health stuff. How am I going to explain that to my kid? How am I going to react if I see it show up in him? What's the conversation that my parents had with me? Now, my parents were great parents, but they were all, you know, my mom's parents were Irish Catholic immigrants. Like my dad's mom taught at a Catholic school. Like repression was mm -hmm. the name of the game. Like, yeah. mm -hmm. so they did a good job of shepherding the conversation forward. Cause you know, it used to just be, oh, you're not depressed. Just go drink. It's like more noble to be an alcoholic <laughs> than to admit that you're depressed. You know, like that really was kind of the attitude I think for a long time. And they did a good job of shepherding it forward and put me in a position where I went and talked about it publicly. And now I think we are a generation of parents that's going to have to start sorting this out. I don't think anybody wants to have like a generation of overly medicated kids, but I also don't think we want, especially as a dad raising a son, like I don't think any of us have an interest in like perpetuating this idea that you need to like be tough and shoulder the load and weather the storm and fight through your problems and all that sort of like, very, very outdated, like hyper masculinity. And I don't think I'm like particularly like a snowflake as some people might accuse. It's just sort of like, I don't want, I don't want my kid to have to just like put his head down and pretend that he doesn't have problems and, and shoulder the load on his own. So mm -hmm. the, a lot of the essay is sort of about kind of like exploring that in a way that's often serious, sometimes comedic, but it just felt like, man, here's an extension of the conversation that doesn't seem to be happening so vocally yet. Maybe I can do some good by putting this out there. Maybe some other people who are looking for it can find it when it was something I was looking for and couldn't quite find. Well, that, I mean, it's interesting that you say that because there's something not at all intimidating about an, an essay. It's very like, it's there for you if you're looking for it. And, and, and there's lots of people out there that are looking for stuff like this. And that's one of the things I really love about some of these things that you're doing, you know, you've got a variety of media and I think it's comforting to know that that stuff is out there because it, it, people are going to be yeah. looking for it. And hopefully as the stigma lessens, the stigma around it, people feel more comfortable about taking the steps towards finding it. And the more places that it is great, the more normal the discussion around it becomes. So I think, think this is one of the interesting things to me about the types of, you know, media that you're, that yeah. you're, you're utilizing for, for the messaging that you've, that you've. Put yeah. Together. I think in general, as a creative person, like even since I started comedy 22 years ago, it's like podcasts didn't exist. Streaming services didn't exist. 
So there's all these different ways that things can get out there in the world. Now there's also just way too much stuff to sort out, you know, to sort through all the time. It's harder to find things, but in terms of being able to just get a message out there, I feel really grateful. You can read it. It's also an audio book. If you want to listen to it, it's short. If it was fiction, it would be a novella, but it's not. So I don't know what you call that. <laughs> it's like longer than like an essay per se, but it's probably not quite a book. And it's like, if you're, if you're out there and you're a dad going like, I want to provide stability for my kid and I want to, them to see me as like a source of strength, but I don't want them to think that I don't have flaws. I don't want to have to hide my problems from them. And I want to know how to deal with it. If they have problems, how to, how am I going to react to that? Like you might, I don't know if you'll find all the answers, but you'll find a lot of catharsis in it. One of the things, Chris, that I've always appreciated about you, and it carries through to your stand-up, to your podcast, to your writing, is you have this authenticity to you. It it never feels like, sometimes with a stand-up comedian, it feels like there is this persona when you're on stage, right? But but with you, and, and I've noticed this with other people in your circle too, you know, like Mike Birbiglia, Pete Holmes, it, it feels like... That's somebody that I can relate to. It never feels like you're putting on a persona. I would imagine that that is important when you, when you are dealing with material that can be deeply personal. I guess I wonder when you were getting into comedy, is that something that was kind of a conscious decision that I'm always going to sort of be true to who I am? Yeah, I mean, I think, first of all, thank you. Well, because that's it's kind to hear. I, I would say it kind of comes from two places. It's like one a lot of it relates to the music I listened to growing up. Like I grew up in the punk circles in North Jersey, going to shows and stuff. And that music is all about authenticity. So I think my instinct with creativity was like, always like, keep it pretty raw, keep it pretty honest, keep it unpretentious and keep it accessible. I always like going to shows where it's like, oh, I just watched this band play and now the guitarist is the one selling me the t-shirt and I get to talk yeah. with them at the table. So everything to me always felt like rawness, honesty, accessibility, like those just felt like the things that always had the most meaning to me and the most impact to me. So I emulated them. And then I think the other thing I would say, honestly, is I'm not the funniest guy by a long shot. Um, and I came up in a scene with a lot of tremendously funny people. Specifically, I was at a theater called the Upright Citizens Brigade when it went through this hot streak that was, I mean, they became an institution for a couple decades. And if you just Google the amount of people you know who are working in comedy right now who came out of that place, it's astounding. Yeah, that's so, yeah. My two best friends when I came up were Bobby Moynihan, who wound up on SNL. And Zach Woods, who was, he played Gabe on The Office. He was on Silicon Valley. Like, and that was like the dudes I was up on stage with like two, three times a week, every week. And then, you know, doing other shows with other people where they're just like incredible. So I kind of realized at a certain point of like, I'm pretty funny, but I'm never going to be as funny as these people. Like these people can't miss. They don't miss. Like imagine playing <laughs> basketball and the other people just never miss a shot. Like, <laughs> but what happens there is, you know, they all respect me. They all like being on stage with me. And I sit here and I go, well, why? And one thing that I realized is I go, you know, I'm not the funniest person on stage, but I'm generally the most willing to be honest. I'm the most willing to go to an honest place or a dark place or to reveal something about myself. Uh, and Burbigley actually pointed out to me a few years ago, he's like, out of everybody at UCB, you're the only one who is like a core person there who's known for being yourself. Like everybody else is known for the characters they play or mm -hmm. the writing gigs they got. Like people think of you like a stand up, like you are you, but you came out of a scene. And so some of it was necessity. Some of it was like, I better be honest or else I can't keep up with these people. They're too good. You try to be funny on stage with Bobby Moynihan. Like you're never going to be. <laughs> the funniest one. So you better find another angle. And for me, a lot of that was authenticity and kind of like diving headfirst and stuff that might seem like uh, taboo or off-putting to other people. For me, one of, one of the biggest takeaways um, from dad on pills, and this is something that you talk about in the article, the medium article as well, that for Cal, Cal has no responsibility for Anything to do with your, Chris, your yeah. health and well-being. Yeah. And a lot of the, in the essay, one of the parts that's actually getting the most response from people who read it is there's this joke that people have made to me when my wife was pregnant and especially right after my son was born. And it's come up a few times where people say some variation of like, oh, you got a kid now. I guess you can't kill yourself. 
And like, look, I'm a comedian, so people make dark jokes. And I've been very public. I was on HBO talking about mental health stuff, so it's out there. So it's not like people, it's not as aggressive. But when you think about what's behind that, I go, oh, no, 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 no. Like that, people are like chuckling about that. Maybe that's their own awkwardness or tension surrounding Mm -hmm. talking about this stuff. But I go, no, that joke's not okay. Like, I don't have to stay alive because of this kid. Like, I got to stay alive because I want to be a healthy person who's in this world. Like, being a part of society and contributing and finding all these joys in it. But that's not his job. Like the amount of pressure that would put on him and God forbid, like I'm happy to tell you I'm doing so much better than I was years ago. God forbid I fall into something akin to what I fell into years ago. He's not responsible for that. Like he did not create any pressure in my life that would ever make him responsible for that. And you know, there's so many examples of people I know. You can think of friends who you grew up with where you go, oh man, like parents asking kids to kind of be responsible for stuff that was probably outside of the sphere of what a kid should be responsible for. So I'm just extraordinarily aware of this. All this kid has to do is grow up, play with dinosaurs, get mad at me when I won't let him watch another episode of PJ Masks. Like, that's what a kid does. That's what he's responsible for. He's not responsible for me, you know, keeping my head out of an oven. That's He's two. He doesn't have to even know about that for a while. Uh, it's on me to work extraordinarily hard so that he never has to feel responsible for that. And there will undoubtedly be times that he becomes aware that I walk around with bottles of pills in my pockets because I take them so often. He'll become aware of that. But by the time he becomes aware of that, I hope that we've already set a tone and laid a foundation where he doesn't feel like he is a driving force of it in any way. Like it pre-existed him by many decades. So I feel like that's like one of the basics that I kind of instinctively, and everybody I'm sure figures out their own stuff about parenting, but I just instinctively was like, okay, I got to be really clear about boxing that out because I come with a lot of baggage as a dad. I got to carry all that baggage myself because it's a heavy lift. Yeah. I don't want him to have to lift it. I'm yeah. aware of that. And uh, it's daunting. It's daunting. Mm-hmm. But I hope that I'm doing him a service by kind of shouting that to the hilltops as early in his life as I am. I think, I think that, that quality of being like aware as a, as a dad, I mean, that's, a, that's such a thing that pops up on this show in our conversations. The, the idea of what is a, modern dad, what does it mean? Modern dadhood. And and that's, there's that sort of old timey idea of dad comes home, kicks his shoes off, puts on his slippers. He goes to his den. Sometimes there's the, 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 the fun memories. Sometimes there's the crappy memories, but it's, oh, it seems to be a lot of it. It feels like as if it's at a distance and that quality of like being aware. I just feel like that's such a, it's just an observation that I'm making. It's one of those things that, that comes up, uh, comes up a lot on this show. I'm with you. I feel like, I feel like we are, there's like a a movement happening now where it's like society in general, you see so many people right now going like, why are we so work obsessed in America? I don't want to be a workaholic. Mm -hmm. I don't want to just overwork myself. And then I think about my dad who was again, great, but he'd be the first to tell you, man, did he work himself to the bone and man, did that sometimes affect our ability to connect? And that's something that I think he and I, I recently, I, I felt so bad. I broke his heart, man. I broke his heart. I was visiting him. He asked me to help him move something heavy. And he was, I have an older brother and he's like, yeah, like your brother, I asked him to do stuff like this and this, but he's like, for some reason with moving, even when you were, though you were younger, I always, I would ask you to help carry stuff. And that's true. Like when they moved out of their house in Jersey, he called me, I drove over and helped. And I was like, yeah, it's like funny. I was like, I got a lot of fond memories of that when we moved you out of your house. Cause I felt like that's the first time that you and I like were able to just like let our guards down and like connect. Hmm. He looked at me and he looked so heartbroken. Hmm. And he's like, you were like 24, 25. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. And he's like, you felt like you couldn't really talk to me until we, you were like in your mid twenties. And I was like, yeah, man, you worked so hard. And I was always, you were tired and stressed. And I wow. I have so many great memories. Don't get me wrong. So many great memories, but I definitely was well aware that my dad was like super tired and overworked and stressed out. And I'm like, we just see a societal movement right now. People going like, I don't want to do that. And I think for dads in particular, right? Like I don't want to work myself to the bone if it means I don't get to hang out with my kid as much. Right. Like, like I, I think so much about like 
this obsession with toughness my generation was handed. And it's like, I don't want my kid to feel like he needs to like be tough. I want him to understand there's like, yeah, you can be strong. If you like strike out in a baseball game, I don't want you to like glance in my direction in the bleachers to see if I'm mad. Like, yeah, I don't even want that to be a factor. You know, there's like all these things that we were raised with that I think societally we're all going, eh, there was like a macho-ness that we don't need anymore. Right. There was a workaholic streak that we don't need anymore. And all of those things do tie into fatherhood in such a big way, right? Well, they tie into fatherhood and they tie into mental health, you know, mental health and well-being, yeah. you know, just a general sense of well-being, like scale back and focus on what's important to you and what you need to be healthy and to live a happy life. Because who fucking cares about everything else? Yeah. And then you get people who like to, you know, and certainly in comedy, I feel like there's a whole wing of comedy. that's like, we're raising a generation and they're going to be too soft. And there's a part of me that hears that like as a dad and as a comedian is like. I think that's fine. Yeah. I'm okay with yeah. that. If my kid yeah. had, if my kid's softer than I was, sure. If he doesn't have to like, I was, I grew up in a place where it was like, yeah, you, you wound up getting in fights cause you felt like you had to sometimes like, I don't want to get in fights. I wish that never happened. I hope my son doesn't get in fights. Is that, is that going to make him too soft? Like, all right, I guess I'm fine with that. I'm totally fine with that. And if he thinks I'm a little soft, yeah, maybe I think my dad and I have a softer relationship now. And I, this is a perfect way to put it. He and I will never speak about this. We're not there yet, <laughs> but I bet he is also grateful that our relationship's a little softer than it used to be. Like I said, that, that tells you everything you need to know, right? I'll never know. Cause I'll never ask him and he'll never open up and tell me. But my, if I was betting money, he's probably psyched that he and I have softened up with each other too. So I'm, I'm, I want to start a little closer to that with Cal. Cause I want to know this kid and I don't want him to only know me as the, the, you know, my dad was the rock of our family in a big way. He did a fantastic job of it, but I knew him as that maybe a little more than I knew him as the guy he is. And I'm so psyched. I know him as the guy he is now. He's a good guy. It's so crazy that it takes full generations sometimes for these changes and shifts to happen. But like you said a few minutes ago, we are in a unique position where, we're in the middle of one of these shifts and we can actually do things to help push it forward and to sort of hit the reset button in, in some ways. Yeah, we really are. We're like the first people raising kids where it's not taboo to say you see a shrink. Like that's yeah, right. astounding. I, I write in the piece, like I only mention it in passing a couple of times, but like there was a kid a grade below me in school and it came out that he saw a psychiatrist when we were all in third, fourth, fifth grade and like, it was used against him. It was, it yeah. was weaponized. I don't think that would happen in schools now. That would be viewed as really bad. So it's like, we are the first generation of parents where it's commendable and viewed as a positive step and a thing to rally around when people take care of their mental health. So we got to start thinking about how that extends forward to our kids. Cause my hope is that when my kid inevitably has stretches where he struggles he will feel a lot less alone in it and he will feel much less of a desire to hide it. And I think that those are accomplishable goals for our generation of parents. Our conversation with Chris Gethard has been fantastic so far and there's still a lot that we talked about and we'll get to the second part of our conversation in the next episode. And in the meantime, you can go to our show notes where there's a link to a free month subscription for Scribd, where you can find Chris's essay, Dad on Pills, and a bunch of other awesome stuff. So check that out. We don't happen to be at a point in an episode of the podcast where we do a recurring segment, do we? Do we happen to be at like that point in an episode? We are 84% of the way through this podcast. And yes, it's time for a recurring segment. What's it going to be? <clears throat> I have a, did I just say that out loud? Okay. Um, I have three of these. I'll try. You want to narrow it down to one? I'll try. I'll try. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I said this quite recently. Don't use your dinosaurs to stab, please. Stab. <laughs> Don't use your dinosaurs to stab, please. 
It's exactly what it sounds like, right? It, it basically, yeah, uh, <laughs> it is pretty much. It was a little hectic. It was a little chaotic. This was late in the day. I think we had already said several times, boys, it's time to go upstairs for bath time. I mean, this was definitely a, did I just say that out loud? But it also, um, it really just, it followed a whole bunch of like, did I just allow all of this to happen? You know, <laughs> yeah. like that, you know, and like, did this happen under my watch? Really? Yeah. Yeah. Like I was okay with this. We got this game recently. That's like a, it's like a barrel and you put a pirate in the barrel and then you, you take these little plastic swords and each player takes a turn putting a sword inside the barrel. And w- at some, I, I at some point, it. yeah, at some point, somebody's sword will go in and it will trigger the thing and the, and the, the pirate will just come jumping out. And it's funny. <laughs> it's okay. a little, it's a little like, you know, it's a little like Kerplunk or like thin ice, you know, same, same premise of all of those games. Sure. The boys had gone a little Lord of the, of the flies and they had sort of ditched the game and they had found, um, the box that the game came in and they were, they were sort of taking the, the little plastic knives and they were, and they were stabbing the box. Okay. Okay. Initially when it started, it, they were kind of just being goofy and, you know, they knew that it would annoy me that they were ruining the box that the game came in. Cause I'm, I'm that guy. I'm like, don't ruin the box. That's the, that's the game's box. Like, where are we going to put the game pieces if you ruin the box? So initially it started. You're, that's not being that guy. I mean, that's being, that just being a parent. That's being a person who appreciates some degree of organization and order. Thank you. But it, it like eventually it kind of turned from sort of a funny, you know, I'm being silly, goofy to um, much more of sort of this primal, instinctual thing where like it, they, they, they were just getting way more pleasure out of this like stabbing thing than I was OK with. And like I said, it was it was supposed to be bath time. And, and I, I feel like at this point already, in fact, Jamie was upstairs drawing said bath like i'm pretty sure like we were supposed to be on the way up and they were just stabbing the ever-loving crap out of this box and um as i was kind of like walking by the room that they were in like i heard my one son kind of like so i'm like so like throw the little plastic (laughs) sword to the side and uh he goes he goes i'm gonna get a t-rex Like with way too much like enthusiasm. And I pictured the T-Rex, which is this very large, I mean, eight to 10 inch long, hard plastic thing with lots of spikes. I can picture that. Oh, yeah. I mean, that puts the tail of that thing. If you jam it hard enough into a piece of sheet rock, like it puts a hole in the wall. Right. And and there's there are many dents about toddler high (laughs) all over this house. And a lot of them are from these dinosaurs. Uh, but yeah, he's, he said that with like, uh, you know, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if there was a little foam at the corner of his mouth when he said (laughs) that. And that's when I was like blood, bloodshot eyes. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Hair, like just sticking up, you know, (laughs) like somehow his shirt was torn, you know, like, (laughs) Yeah, it was a little bit, uh, it was a little so bit So did nuts. you put, what's the phrase? Did you 86 that before he even <laughs> had a chance to uh, get his hands on the dinosaur? Well, I kind of, so our house is sort of this open concept. So there's like this sort of circular area that you can kind of walk around. And I was like about to go like, uh, I was, I was going away the long way around. And my plan was to pick up a couple things and come back through the other room. And, uh. That's when I yelled out, you know, don't use your dinosaurs to stab, please. And how, and what, how was that received? Uh, when I came back in the room, he was using a dinosaur to stab. <laughs> so it was, Sounds like it wasn't received. It was not received, which is like story of our lives right now. Anyway, it was, uh, yeah, it was one of those things that as I was saying it, I was like, do I even, do I have to say this? Like, loudly across the house for everyone to hear me well you said it out loud and i'm glad you did because that was fun to hear (laughs) 
comments, listening, you can find us at moderndadhood.com or wherever you listen to podcasts. That might be Apple, Stitcher, Spotify, Amazon, Gethcasts, Gethardcasts. Wherever you like to listen, please do subscribe, leave us a quick rating and review, and mention Modern Dadhood to a friend. If you, listener, haven't given up completely on social media like I have, you can find Modern Dadhood there. If you wish, we're on Instagram. We have a Facebook. We have a the Facebook. Some funny clips on YouTube. If you're if you're into that, we would invite you to drop us a line at hey h e y at moderndadhood.com. Tell us what's up. Tell us who you'd like to hear from. Tell us what topics you'd like to hear about. Thank you uh, to Casper Baby Pants and Spencer Albi for the music that you hear in Modern Dadhood. Thank you to Pete Morse at Red Vault Audio for, he's got all these buttons and these knobs and these faders and these sliders and probably a screen and a bunch of other really amazing stuff that he does to make us sound like um, we're professionals when we, we're, we're not. And also, hey, thank you to Chris Gethard for joining us on the podcast. And don't forget to tune in in our next episode where you will hear the second half of our conversation with Chris. Mark, I can't take this last thank you away from you. This is your thing. So have at it. And also, thank you all for listening.